Today, we're going to have to tear some stuff down. Right? The Bible says that there's a time to build up and there's a time to, to tear things down. And so to the last kind of phrase that has been rattling around in, in my soul has been, we need to reject expectations. That we need to reject these expectations that, the, and by the way, I don't know if you realize this, but the world is full of expectations, right? Can, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Like, there are things that people expect you to say, to do, to be, and, and your life is just full of those expectations. You have expectations. And by the way, some of those expectations are good. Let me start off by saying that. There are good expectations. When your parents have expectations for you, that's a good thing. When teachers and bosses have expectations, it's not like that's an, an evil thing, right? Because, in fact, the church teaches that a lot, right? Honor your father and mother. That's a Ten Commandment thing. That's a, that's a God thing. That's good. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, right? Or Ephesians 6, it says something similar. It says, Servants, obey your boss and respect him with all your heart. So, so having some expectations is a good thing, but parents and bosses aren't the only place that we're going to find expectations in our lives. In relationships, uh, social dynamics, and, and schedules, and habits, there's going to be a lot of expectations that you have. And what, what I think we're experiencing is somewhere along the way, we've let good expectations outgrow the box that God put them in and the boundaries that God has put around them. And we've let the world's expectations make demands of us that maybe we don't even realize we're, we're dealing with, that maybe God never asked us to do. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of burnout. You're seeing a lot of depression. You're seeing a lot of frustration. And all these things that are running rampant in our culture, and it's because we're living in a way that God never never intention for us to live, right? The truth is bad expectations will kill your soul rest, right? Again, maybe, and maybe you need to, to circle that word bad because again, not all expectations are bad, but bad expectations will kill your soul rest. By the way, if you've never heard of this phrase of, of, of soul rest, we get that from the words of Jesus where he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, heavy burdened, come to me and, and you will find rest for your soul. That is a promise that Jesus makes to us if we take on his yoke, if we take on his teachings, if we take on his way of life. And so we want to make sure today that we are rejecting certain expectations that the world puts on us that I can tell you for a lot of, a lot of years I never even realized was having an effect on me. And I think that uh, the, the anecdote to to that is found in Romans chapter 12. So I want to read, we're going to read more than just the first couple verses, but I want to start with Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. I want you to follow along with me. I'm reading the NLT. It'll be on the screen. You can read along in your, your copy of God's Word as well. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this. It says, So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God <coughs> because of the, all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So I don't know if you ever heard that verse before. Um, some of you that have been a part of our, our church for a while, you probably have, because I used to whip that thing out all the time in, in youth group, man. I used that verse. Uh, in fact, we even tried to make a t-shirt one time that said, drop the world, and it had this Bible. Of course, I made a spelling error on it, and it haunts me to this day. That, that We printed all these cool-looking t-shirts with, with a weird typo and stuff like that. But, but it's this idea, and I've always preached this, like, hey, sin bad, don't sin right? Like, like, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of the world. That means sin is bad, live righteously, kill sin, right? Which is a good thing. Can we agree on that? Like, that's, that's not a bad thing. In fact, Philippians 2.15 tells us to live clean and innocent lives as, uh, as children of the Lord, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. We're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to be different. 
But as I begin to, to think about Romans 12 in context, again, great idea is to never just read one Bible verse, but read the verses before and the verses after, and, and you start to understand the context of what that, that person under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit actually meant by that. And, and don't copy the behaviors and the customs of the world actually means a whole lot more than don't sin. Right? Um, because here's the problem. Too many Christians are running a race that God never intended. Too many Christians even, not just lost folks, they're running that race too, but too many Christians are running a race, or at least they're running that race at a pace that God never intended. You know, the Apostle Paul did call the Christian life a race, right? Run the race faithfully. But, but there is, because of the world's expectations, we begin to run a race or run it in such a way that God's like, whoa, 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 that's not what I've actually told you to do. Uh, and, and so today I want to look at some of these expectations because that's why we do it. That's why we get burnt out. That's why we're unfulfilled and unsatisfied and never able to j just be at peace is because the world is making expectations of us and we feel like we have to meet them. And there are certain expectations that we just need to say, thanks, I'll pass. No, I don't accept your premise. I don't accept that that's something that I have to do, right? And so uh, I'm going to try to fly at a, at a kind of a bird's eye view because I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you today to give you the specifics. I mean, we'll drill down into some specifics, but your life is different than my life. It was different than their life. It was different than their life. And so the Holy Spirit is going to be able to tell you specifically what you need to reject, what type of expectations you need to just say, mm, no, you say that, but no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to feed into that. And so there's, there's two big categories that I want us to look at uh, today that we need to reject. Um, and again, I know this is, this is not going to be as positive and encouraging, but it's going to be a blessing. All right. So the, one of the things that we need to do is we need to reject worldly motivations, Right, one bucket, one category that we need to make sure that we are rejecting is worldly motivations. I'm going to throw out some phrases to you, and I want you to see if you've ever heard of these before. Better yourself. Follow your dreams. Seize the day. Live your best life. YOLO. That, that one didn't age well. That one sounded dumb when it came out a couple years ago. It's even dumber now, YOLO. You only live once, right? They, these, are, these, are wor these are ideas that the world pushes on us that most Christians go, well, yeah, I guess. That would be fine. But look at the motivation behind those phrases. Better yourself. Follow your dreams. Seize the day for what you want to do. Right? There is a, the world is always nudging you and saying, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Be selfish. Think about number one first. Doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. You take care of you. But God's response, God's calling is actually the exact opposite of that. What did verse one of, of Romans 12 say? Be a living sacrifice. Give yourself as a living sacrifice. That means you're a walking, breathing sacrifice saying, God, you want this? Take this. You want that? Take that. Oh, you want me to do this for this other person? Good. I will give up and give up and give up things that you would know that the rest of the world holds on to so tightly. Here's some other ones. My body, my choice. Ooh, that gets political right? Both sides of the aisle have been using that one lately, right? But, or or uh, what's another one? It's, it's my life. You can't tell me what to do. Don't tread on me. All these things that, that we, depending on who you are, they, they, they manifest themselves in different attitudes and different tribes and different politics and stuff. But it, if you go back to the motivation, it's what I want. And God's word does an exact opposite, tells you to go the exact opposite way. 1 Corinthians 6 says, you are not your own, Christian. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Not do whatever the heck you want to do. You were bought at a price because, you know, it's not your life, your choice. It's not your body, your choice. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have given yourselves up to him. You were bought and purchased with a high price. And that has some 
you know, knocks over some dominoes in your life, and it should change your motivations. Now, let me, I feel like i got to say this every, every sermon. This is not an excuse to be lazy and useless, right? When you reject expectations, be like, well, Ben says, don't reject my expectations, and my boss wants me to come in today, and he expects that. I'm going to reject that and sit my butt at home, right? Don't, that's not what I'm talking about, right? Because in the same breath, by the way, when, when Paul tells him all this stuff that we just read, he, he says in verse 11 of Romans 12, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically, right? So you're doing stuff, but you're doing it with the right motivations. What's the motivations of that? Serving the Lord enthusiastically. Not serving your own purposes, not serving your own selfish ambitions, but serving God in that way. It's just like that, that light, easy yoke that Jesus talks about, right? A yoke means work. That was what you put on the ox to drag the field, to plant the field. So there's, there's work to be done, but you can do it in a way because you're doing it for God and you're doing it through his power that you don't get burnt out. You don't get overwhelmed. You have rest for your soul. That's how Jesus in the same breath can say, here, come do all this stuff for me. But if you do that, know that because I've set it up this way, you will have rest for your soul. And so the world expects you to live with selfish motivations. In fact, they will, it's getting so bad now that they're like, yeah, to, you need to be selfish. Girl, be selfish, right? Have you a you day, right? Be, and it's like it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a good idea for us to, to, and it's healthy and therapeutic for you to be selfish. And we have to choose a better way. By the way, this is what's driving the current culture shift when it comes to sexuality and gender, when it comes to our education and our economy. It's all based in a selfish motivation, and we have to be better. Jesus says there is a better way to operate, and that's when you're motivated by the right things. Because you can do good things for bad reasons, and it's going to stink. It's not going to work. And you're going to be like, but I'm doing these good things, but your motivation is selfish. Right? There's a lot of people that will help somebody else just so that they can Instagram it. But look at how great I am. I'm, you know, I've done all these mission trips where they have more selfies with third world children. You know, like, look at how great I am. I'm helping them. God says, that's all the rewards you're going to get. It's some clout. But, but you're losing the blessing because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Motivation really matters. And it matters not only to how God sees it, but it matters to how much of a blessing it is for your life and whether your soul will be at rest or not, right? So how you, how you treat your neighbors, how you do at your job, all that, all that has to do with your motivation. So we have to reject worldly motivations in order to have soul rest. But there's another category, another, another bucket that you have to, to put this in and, and reject. And we, that is we have to reject worldly wisdom. We have to reject worldly wisdom. You know, it says, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of the world. That was the command, right? But how do we do that? What, did, what was the answer to that? Verse 2 says, let God change the way you think. You have to fundamentally realign yourself from being uh, conventional wisdom and, and, and what the world says and what the prevailing thought of the day is to, I need to let the, the creator of the universe change the way I think because worldly wisdom will not, uh, will not turn into blessings for a believer, right? Uh, and again, to be clear, I'm not saying that we reject everything that's not specifically in the Bible, right? Science textbooks and math textbooks and biographies, all very useful things. They're not the Bible, but I'm not, when I mean reject uh, worldly wisdom, I mean 2 Corinthians 1.12. This is, this is the one, this verse has been so good for me lately. It says, for our boast is this, that we behave in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God. This is what you can actually brag about. You want to brag about something? Brag about not how busy you are. Brag about not how important you are and how you've just been, all, this, all these worldly expectations that you're exceeding or meeting. Don't brag about that. Brag that you lived simply and sincerely in the world by the grace of God, not by earthly wisdom. You see how, how it implies there that, that godly wisdom leads to simplicity and godly sincerity? By the way, that phrase, let me chase this rabbit for a second. Think about how much that's lacking in our world, simplicity, godly sincerity, right? Because it is the, the 
um, the bragging rights of everything. I'm just so busy. I just got so much going on. And life is very complicated. In fact, I was reading a book this past year that, w- that mentioned that we have access to infinitely more information than we've ever had, right, thanks to the Internet, and yet we're not any happier we're not any healthier. We're not any more fulfilled, even though we know stuff, but our world is just really complex. And there's something, that's why some people are like, I just want to like move out to a cave in Montana and get away from the world. I get it because the world is just so complicated and sometimes you just want some simplicity. Now that's one of the, again, one of the tenets of soul rest. But then <laughs> godly sincerity is also lacking. Think about how we greet each other. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Great, see you later. Like, it, like it's just a formality. Isn't it weird when someone actually answers that question? Like, how are you? Well, I'm not great. Oh, God, here we go. I don't have time for this. All right, how are you doing? Well, and what if we answered that honestly? Well, I'm feeling a little crampy today, and uh, I'm hungry, and my kids are driving me crazy, and my, my job is unfulfilling. Oh, uh... All right, pray, I'll pray for you. See you later. Right? <laughs> Godly sincerity means you actually do care how they are. I've been trying to do that lately. Like, if I ask you how are you doing, I really want to know. Because if I, if I see someone that I don't want to know, I'll go, hope you're well. <laughs> that's, a, that's a statement. <laughs> I'm not asking. Right? I hope you're doing well. Have a good one. Right? Because I have resolved. Once this dawned on me, I went, I don't want to be fake. So let me just be sincere, and, and so if, if I ask you how you're doing, feel free to tell me all the sticky, gory details, okay? Because I actually want to know, because that's what we need is worldly, uh, we need godly sincerity instead of this worldly veneer of you got it together, and you're going through the motions, and you don't actually really care how they're doing, you're just trying to greet them and get them out of your way, Right? I know that's a rabbit trail, but it really has been impressed on me lately that we need that simplicity and that sincerity. Colossians 2.8 is another verse I like. It says, uh, don't, let the, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. You're going to hear a lot of stuff in the world that's going to sound really smart, but then when you actually think about it with the Holy Spirit and with your God-given common sense, you're going to go, that was a bunch of nothing. That was a bunch of hippy-dippy baloney, as the Lego movie would say, right? It's a bunch of high-sounding nonsense. By the way, that's one of the main reasons I have TikTok right now. I don't TikTok much, right? Uh, that's, that's why I draw the line, right? I, was, I did Facebook and did Instagram, Snapchat and TikTok, and you have it. I'm too old for that. It makes me angry and grumpy. But I have it because that is an unfiltered look at the wisdom of the world. I see all these TikToks where they're trying to be like, ooh, that's, that's deep. That's impactful. That's, and, and you're going, what are you even saying? Right? It's like 1 Corinthians 3.19. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Right? We have to think with a higher wisdom. Wisdom is not always wrapped up in knowledge and, and, and what you know. It, it's, it's something that's from God. And so when we reject worldly wisdom, we have to replace that. By the way, again, that's like, don't, don't be like, well, I ain't doing no more book learning then. That's what Pastor Preacher Ben done said. That's not what I'm talking about. All right, I want you to get the wisdom from God. James 1.5 says, if you need wisdom, ask your generous God, and he will give it to you, and he will not rebuke you for asking. You don't have because you don't ask. You feel like you're not very wise? Pray about it. Seek it earnestly. Right? Pay attention and let God give you his wisdom. And I know this is unpopular because there's a lot of pressure, in, especially in this day and age, but this is not new to us, where uh, we automatically equate new with better. We automatically equate this modern thing with progress, right? That, that things that are progressive aren't always better, right? When, when, when the, the original text says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, that literal translation is this age, right? Meaning that you, we think that we're so much better. It's this, this uh, there's a word for it. I don't remember what it is, but basically it's this mentality. You think that just because we're at a later period of history that we're just better or something because we've figured it out and those imbeciles in those dark ages just didn't know what you're talking about, right? But we, and I, I hear that all the time, by the way, you actually start trying to defend the word of God. You're going to hear stuff like that old fashioned book, how antiquated of it. You actually still believe that? 
Oh, that is, that's old-fashioned. Who actually goes by that? This is how the world works now. I've heard that a lot. That's just not how the world works, Bible thumper. Right? What? That's not how the world works. But take that phrase, this is how the world works, and apply that at some other points in history. Like, I don't know, during slavery, during uh, the lack of civil rights, and all these other historic atrocities that we've seen in history. You know what the people of the time said? It's just how the world works. And we look back at that and go, are you serious? Yes, that's how the world works, and you are okay with that? I really, believe, I really hope that future generations look back at the abortion epidemic and go, y'all thought that was okay? That was genocide. Why would you think like that? Right? Because the world's wisdom is not God's wisdom. It expects us to be a certain way. But the truth is, to be a Christian is to be weird. Right? Just y'all are weird, man. I love you, but you're weird. And that's a good thing. Right? That was uh, FFC Liberty just finished doing that book. There's a book. Actually, we've got it on our bookshelf if you want to check it out there in the library or in the cafe uh, library there called Weird. Because that's really, it's like, if you're a Christian and you actually live like it, you're going to be weird. You're going to stick out like a, uh, like a sore thumb. Right? Because guess what? The world is selfish. Be weird and think about other people first. The world is is tribal. They're po political. You need to be weird and think above that and think about what unites us in Christ. The world is petty. Don't be petty. Be weird. Be weird enough to overlook an offense, to overlook a preference. The world says, go live your best life now. Jesus is weird. He says, actually, I need you to come and die, if you don't mind. Come take up a cross. Come follow me. Come die to yourself and your own preferences. Be weird. Nobody does that. Everyone's chasing their own dreams and ambitions. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm going to need you to just put that on the cross. And I'm going to need you to take up my call for your life. That's weird. And that's what we're supposed to do. Acts 5.29 is where the disciple says, we must obey God rather than human beings. Right? If, if it comes down to it and the world expects one thing and God expects the other, who are you going to who are you going to bow to what expectations put weight in your life you're going, again you're going what does this have to do with soul rest this world is not a restful place is it this world is exhausting and if we want that peace if we want that contentment if we want that joy then we have to resist some expectations and just say no i know that's what you want for me because it makes you feel better about your crazy life but i don't have to accept that because that's not from god Right, let me get specific. This is true in dating. Those of you that are in that crazy, uh, chaotic thing called the dating world. Now, I would, I would not be able to handle Tinder when I was out there dating. Like, I, I'm so glad. Thank you, Jenna, for settling on me. It's been great. Because um, I ain't trying to deal with, I'm not trying to deal with putting, the, I mean, think about it. The, the world says, yeah, you can lust. That's natural. Yeah, you can, you, you can be shallow. You can be selfish. What do you want in somebody else? We view dating as, as like you're going to the store and picking out the things that you want to satisfy yourself instead of looking at it as an opportunity to be sanctified and to love someone else and to put someone else first, right? That's why it's all the, we, we've talked about this before. Well, you ain't going to uh, buy a car without test driving it, are you? It's the stupidest thing. Are you dating a car or are you dating a person? Right? Like, don't. That's the world's wisdom. You won't test drive the car for you before you buy it. Whatever. Right? Like, uh, marriage, by the way, is the same thing. I, I presided over a wedding uh, of non believers here recently. And, and one of the things I said, So tell me about your vows. Because I get real Jesus y in my vows. And I know you don't believe in Jesus. So let's talk. Right? Let's just get the elephant in the room here. And she said, Well, I know in the traditional vows, uh, it says that I'm supposed to honor and obey my husband, but I don't plan on doing that, so don't be saying that. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's good. Of, you're going to have a good time. All right, you're going <laughs> to. Why? Right, why? Because God's, God's plan for marriage is that the, the man and the woman, the husband and the wife, are equal in value, but they have separate roles, right? And, and it, is, it is God's burden on a husband to lead his family. And the world says, you don't do that. Right? The, for many reasons, that's a whole other sermon, but there, the, for, the world doesn't want you to do that. And yet, if you do that, you're going to be weird. 
Parents, oh, I feel it the most in parenting. Because in parenting, there's all these expectations of what your kid is supposed to be and do. And it's, you're supposed, they're supposed to get all the best grades and get all, all the best colleges and have all the things. And you're, oh, you're, you don't have a car saved up for them and you don't have all this stuff. And, and we, we end up comparing and going, well, my kid doesn't do that. I need to make sure that they play every sport that they want and do every activity that they want. And then it's usually to the detriment of, I don't know, your family. Or we don't spend near as much time developing their own relationship with Jesus. But they can throw a football. Great. But they don't know Jesus like they should. And they've been modeled this frantic, chaotic way of life because you've been trying to push them to do anything because you don't want to have a conversation with them because they're awkward and weird and you don't know how to handle it. Right? There's a lot of those expectations in parenting. Money is real bad. Right? Like the world expects you to have certain things financially, materially, right? But why would you want to keep up with the Joneses? I know the Joneses, and they're lost, and they're miserable, and they're in debt, and, and they hate their life. Why do you, why would you, but they got a nice car. They got a big old house. They got all the things that you think you have to have. There's these expectations, and you could just go, no, I don't need that. I know you're looking at me funny because I don't have these things that you say you need, but that's not what brings me joy, and you can be just, imagine if you didn't have the bills that you have piled up right now. Imagine if you just said, I'm going to live simply and not have to have all these things. And I'm going to let my self-worth not be wrapped up in what I have, but who I am in Christ. That's weird. But it's the path to having rest for your soul. You see, the truth is, the expectations that we give weight to show us whose approval really matters. Because you know what? God has some expectations. Let's talk about that easy yoke. What does God tell you to do? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Make disciples. Build the kingdom. Well, we can add another couple things in there and get specific. He has certain expectations of you, but his yoke is easy to bear. His burden is light. You are not going to feel like you're constantly out of gas when you're living that way. When you're living at the pace of Jesus, you've allowed enough time for yourself to be renewed and strengthened by your relationship with him. And then you're not going to be looking for that next fix, that next little thing that, that's going to, okay, well, if I could just get this, if I could just have this, guess what? My house is two times as big as the house I had when we first got married. That doesn't affect my happiness at all. If I was looking to that house to make me happy, I'd be in trouble, right? It's the same thing with so many things in our life. So, do you belong to Christ or do you belong to the world? Right? Who, who do you belong to? Because this is important. Because you know what? I love y'all, but I don't know what you think about what I'm wearing today or how, how my beard length is or how my hairstyle is. I don't care what you think. But I care what she thinks. She's my wife, right? I, I, give, I give her the ability I put, to expect certain things out of me because we belong to each other. We're in covenant marriage and so if she goes, that outfit just ain't, mm -mm. <laughs> okay, I'll change my outfit. Not that she does that, but, right, because I look good in anything, so, you know, it's, <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> anyway, that's, so, but think about, her expectations matter more to me, shouldn't they? I mean, that's a good thing, right? Because I belong to her. I belong to you that way. But when we belong to Christ, it's his expectations of us that matter. And when you really belong to Christ and when you really are living in that, then what the world demands of you is not really going to matter. And yet we're, we're yielding to that far too often and we're wondering why it doesn't work out. But the good news is you don't have to live like the world. You don't have to burden yourselves with this desire, this insatiable, unfillable uh, untenable desire for, you know, wealth and pleasure and, and fame and whatever, whatever it is that the world wants. You don't have to go after that. This, this verse in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, I never knew what to do with this verse, to be honest, because the, but it, it, it says, make it a goal, the goal of your life or a goal in your life to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you to do before. I used to like read that verse and go, I don't know what to do with that. Where do I file that? Where do, they, where, where do I put that? Because you know what? I'm supposed to do big things for God. I'm important. God's going to use me to do big things. And so 
live a quiet life where nobody knows how awesome I am? And, and nobody gets to see how much God has done in my life? By the way, not to hate on big churches, but I, I've, I've listened to sermons on a lot of these big churches where the pastors are, sell hundreds of books and, or, thousands, or millions of books and, and they, they have their tweets get retweeted and stuff because they're all, they're all saying stuff like, God wants you to be amazing for him. And they're in there like, yes, me, right? They're like, God is moving in your moment. God is, your destiny is determined. Fill in the blank, other tweetable things, right? And they just, they, and, and, and the crowd's eating it up. Why? Because they found a way to put God's stamp on their narcissism, on their self-centeredness, on their selfishness. And they go, yeah, so all the, all the sermons are not about, you know, sacrificing for others and living according to God. It's, it's no, God wants to do something in you. So you are the headliner, and God gets a little mention in the notes after the asterisk. Right? I'm going to change the world for God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something amazing for Jesus. Right? And you just, you just add that to it, and then we think that God's going to be like, all right, I'm going to empower that. When it's, it's very clear that you need to embrace anonymity, you need to embrace, you know, dare I say, uh, not living out your dreams because God's given you a new dream that matters more. By the way, I'm not saying God's not going to do anything amazing through you. I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you is the world's not going to understand how amazing it is. God's going to do miracles. God's going to change people's worlds and eternities. And, and he's going to do some amazing things that when we get to glory, we're going to realize what an impact that had. But it's not going to be seen as anything special by this world. And we have to be okay with that. And we got to stop co-opting the world's values and the world's wisdom and motivations and putting the Jesus sticker on it and thinking it's going to work out. See, here's the thing about being one in a million. There's 999,999 times where you're not. And if you expect every situation and every goal and everything in your life to be one in a million awesome, they're going to write books about and talk about in the, the halls of history, right? then you're going to be vastly disappointed when it doesn't happen that way most of the time. And then you're going to blame God. You're going to say, God, why aren't you, why aren't you making me rich for you? Man, if I was rich, I would, just be, I would just be such a philanthropist. So God, why don't you just hook me up? Oh, you don't, you don't, that's not in your plan. Who are you? What, have you, what are you? And, and we begin to realize that our, our motivation was not for God. Motivation was selfish. And God says there's something better. So let me go back. Let me end today. Let's reread Romans 12.1. I'm going to go a little bit farther, though. And I'm going to show you why I believe that not copying the behaviors and the customs of this, of this world means what we talked about today. It says, so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Then he goes on to say this, because of the privilege and the authority that God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we belong to each other. This is such, uh, this is so much better. This picture that God is painting for us is so much better than the selfish, narcissistic, egocentric way of life that the world tells you to live, right? We all have our roles to play. We're, we're not all going to be the star of the show. And that's how God wants it to be, and it's better that way. So are you willing to play your part? Because guess what? You're going to have to wake up every morning, and you're going to have to choose this. And it's going to be like swimming against the tide. Have you ever done that where you've tried, like you've been on the beach, and the tide takes you like, further and further down the beach and your umbrella is, starts out being right here and now it's way over there because if you don't pay attention you just get brought slowly but surely towards the, the culture the world that we live in is going to slowly but surely draw you towards selfishness 
towards worldly wisdom, thinking like the world and going after things the way the world goes after it. And you're going to have to choose every day with the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit of God to swim against the current. To say, you know what? I'm going to be a living sacrifice today. What can I get up today and instead of get, what can I give? What can I give up? What can I clear out so that, so that I can be everything that God's called me to be? Take up the yoke, the easy, light yoke of Jesus, and you will have rest for your soul.